Here I am today with Bruce Campbell, former legal director of the ACLU of Ohio from 1978 to 1987. We are here at his office at the Columbus Bar Association in Columbus, Ohio on this day, July 12th, 2011. I'm Colleen Benoit. I'll be the interviewer today, history associate at the ACLU of Ohio, 2011 to present. Bruce, thanks for being here today. I'm very glad to do this. Good. So we're going to start with some background questions, just to get to know you a little bit. Okay. Uh, and get to know how you have set on your path to the legal director. So uh, where were you born and in what year? Dayton, Ohio, 1940. Native Ohioan. Yes. Um, Describe your childhood and your family for us a little bit. Uh, my dad was an engineer, uh, worked for Frigidaire. <coughs> um, single child, or single kid, and uh, grew up in a nice little suburban neighborhood and had a relatively untraumatic untra childhood. Good to hear. So, uh, where did you attend college? I went to Purdue. Um, with the thought of following my father's footsteps, being an engineer, uh, engineering chemistry disabused me of that notion. And uh, by that time, I had a girlfriend at Purdue, so it was stay there and try to get a liberal education, which was more or less impossible in a liberal arts or in a engineering school. But that's what I did. So, what did you end up majoring in? psychology, but only because that allowed me the greatest freedom to take other kinds of courses. And so. so how did you figure out that uh, law school would be the right choice for you? I knew it wasn't going to be med school. <laughs> um, so actually, it, it sort of happened in a way. I'd been in debate in high school and, and liked that a lot. And then at Purdue, I got involved in some student government stuff. And among the things was a kind of student court where students who violated something or other would come. And I sort of became like the chief prosecutor of that. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of fun. And, and I was kind of surprised that it was sort of up my alley. So I uh, started thinking of law school. And where did you go to law school? At Ohio State. So you had your first professional position as a staff attorney uh, for the Legal Aid um, Society of Columbus. Can you talk a little bit about that first professional experience and how it set you in the direction you went? Yeah. Actually, I, I went there as a, I guess you'd call it an extern these days, um, mm -hmm. while I was still in law school and really liked the folks there. It was run by a woman, um, we referred to her as Tim, Tim Hall, and um, it was a, a kind of a very close-knit group. There were, at, in those days, it was Legal Aid and Defender Society, so we were both public defenders and doing civil cases too, like evictions and that kind of thing. And it was, uh, you know, we'd all sit around in the afternoon and talk about our cases and just uh, I learned more than I could possibly have uh, wanted to there. It was just great. So that, that sort of put me in the frame of public interest law. Um, one of the people there, Bill Boyland, and I then decided we'd go out and start our, our own firm, and, and uh, we did that for about 12 years or so. What was the name of that firm? Campbell and Boylan, and later Campbell Boylan and Schwarzwalder, and then there were some other names there later on. <coughs> we were sort of, uh, among other things, house counsel to all the hippies in town, um, and uh, that was fun. We, there were a lot of student demonstrations going on then, um, a lot of unrest on campus, <coughs> and we we're sort of in the thick of all that. And so this uh, this firm was in Columbus then, I take it? Yeah. So we were yeah. both you students. Yeah. Um, so you had this legal experience for 11 years, and then you came to the ACLU of Ohio. Could you talk a little bit about how you made that transition? 
um, having the foggiest. <laughs> I started, I don't know, at some point I became connected with ACLU. I met Benson and I remember going to some meetings at his house. And um, At one point I took a case for ACLU and litigated that, whatever it was. And when the job became available, I thought, sounds like fun. And so I took it. So what was your position at the ACLU of Ohio? State legal director. And what years did you serve? <coughs> uh, 78 to 87. Can you describe what you did a little bit for us? Um, I sort of saw my role as being a kind of impresario in that there were all sorts of volunteer um, people who would lend their talents to the organization and I was sort of the person that made needed to make that happen and I mean not that they were reluctant volunteers but sometimes you, you kind of have to uh, assign things to people and that sort of thing um, I had the chance to work with just brilliant people um, uh, OSU professors and just all kinds of very interesting people around the state. And so I just tried to keep the docket uh, going. And, and one of the things that, that impressed me when I got there, uh, Bob App had been the legal director before me. That's APP. And just before he left, he put together a very comprehensive docket of all the stuff that ACLU had been involved in to that point. I don't know whether you have that or not. I don't know if you do. I'd love to find it. I'll, if you do. I'll give it to you. Oh, oh wow. <clears throat> but anyhow, um, it was just amazing to me how many different areas of the law ACLU was into. You know, I thought it, I thought of it as primarily a First Amendment kind of organization uh, and turned out to be much, much more than that. Um, the things that were, at that point, uh, abortion was coming to a head, abortion issues, and we had uh, prison litigation going on and just all sorts of things uh, and a bunch of free speech cases as well. And what was your view on these, these hot topics of the day? I have to say I didn't hadn't thought much about um, reproductive rights before I got there, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it after while I was there. Um, and it became very clear to me which side of that fence I was on. <coughs> Um, there were three or four major cases that centered around the Akron Center for Reproductive Freedom and uh, got involved in those cases with Lou Jacobs and uh, later David Goldberg and <clears throat> just a host of really uh, brilliant lawyers from national can you describe that case for us a little bit? Well, it, <clears throat> the original case was um, against the city of Akron. Uh, they were attempting to, in effect, shut down the Akron Center. And that case ultimately went to the Supreme Court. Uh, Steve Landsman was one of the Chicago, or one of the uh, Cleveland ACLU people, and he litigated that case. We participated on the, the brief, and uh, that was a very big deal. Uh, what kind of precedents did that case set? All good. <coughs> um, I. Sorry to say that uh, we're now looking at some of the same issues as if they hadn't been litigated, and 
you know, laws are being passed right and left that threaten uh, the right of choice. And I thought at one point maybe we'd gotten past that, but we certainly haven't. So. So other than the Akron Center case, what were some of the other more significant cases that you worked on? I was especially interested in the prison litigation that was going on. We had a separate project, the institution project, and it had been litigating a case, uh, Rhodes versus uh, uh, Stewart versus Rhodes, which was against the Ohio, uh, Pen <coughs> the state of Ohio, and its Ohio Penitentiary, which used to sit over about a mile from here. Sort of a medieval fortress and run that way. Uh, it's just an awful, awful prison. Uh, and ACOU, in effect, was able to close it down and to try to make it humane until it was closed down. Uh, that was a long process, and that was pretty much during the whole span of the time I was at ACOU. Uh, it's now a grassy lot, and uh, it's part of what we call the uh, arena district. So it was kind of a famous prison. Uh, o. Henry was in there, and uh, some other notables. Could you tell us a little bit about your experiences with the Kent State cases? Uh, Crossview Roads, 1979. The Kent State case was pretty much over when I when I got there. Um, what was remaining was, and as an archivist, you'll appreciate this: what would happen to all the materials that were collected, um, and were some of which were under seal by court order, and. Those boxes were all stored in in the ACLU headquarters in this room, and they were like floor to ceiling, and uh, looked to me like a total mishmash. Uh, but in any event, they were there, and, and we were under orders to keep them sealed. So there was litigation about that and, and trying to get them out to the public in some way. And the other issue that was going on was a fight for attorney's fees in the case, and uh, that ultimately, we ultimately prevailed on that. Um, this is a more specific question. So, uh, but in 1985, the ACLU filed an amicus um, on behalf of the Ohio Civil Rights Commission uh, in the case Ohio Civil Rights versus. Dayton Christian Schools. Um, do you have any recollection of that case? Well, <clears throat> when you sent me your your list, I said, you know, what is what is she talking about here? <laughs> so I went back and I, I did some. I, went, I got some copies of dockets, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I don't think we filed anything. Okay. I really don't. Okay. Uh, the only thing that I could find, I don't have all of the, the dockets. I'm missing some for 86. And somewhere in there, the conclusion of that may be revealed. Mm -hmm. What I do have is notes from a meeting in 85. Um, in which the issue is being raised. And what the notes say is that we had declined, the board had decided, the ACLU board had decided not to file an amicus in the Sixth Circuit. And the question was then whether we filed in the Supreme Court when it went there. I looked at the Supreme Court decision. There's no mention of any amicus, not necessarily, I mean, they don't always acknowledge amicus, amicus briefs, but 
and and what happened was that the case was really decided on a an abstention issue, uh, saying that the trial court should never have gotten into the case in the first place. It was not a federal issue. Uh, so I think the debate between national and the local, this, and this is pure conjecture at this point because I don't remember, mm -hmm. I think what happened was that national was, th this case involved a woman who was fired from a private, highly religious school because she, among other things, jumped, in their view, the biblical chain of command mm -hmm. and, and took her case to the Civil Rights uh, Commission, and that offended their principles. So that's basically what the case was about. And it, it, it involved both a civil rights issue, uh, a woman's right issue, but also two separate types of First Amendment issues, establishment and uh, free exercise. Um, what I think probably happened is that National focused on the civil rights side and Benson being Benson <laughs> uh, was hard after the religious freedom uh, issue and I suppose that had we filed a brief it would have been in favor of the school whereas National would have favored the right of the uh, OCRC to intervene, or to... At that point, all they wanted to do was investigate. They weren't contemplating any action, so... Ann and I have tried to piece that together. We were looking at former cases, and for the life of us, we could not figure out if the brief was ever filed. We knew that there was a potential schism between the affiliate and the National but then we could never answer for sure what had happened. Is there a file? We looked at um, the dockets and we looked at uh, meeting minutes from the board. Yeah. And um, the one page where I think it was, you know, the notes that would have given us our answer was missing. So we, <laughs> so when I had a seminar, when I interview Bruce, I'm going to ask him, it made me crazy. Um, but that, I think, in general, then, what was the relationship between the affiliate and National? Did you guys split on a lot of issues, or were you... No, 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 not a lot. Yeah. Um, we, and, and certainly in terms of uh, uh, women's issues, we were, except for possibly that case, we were in lockstep. And, you know, much, we got tremendous help from, from the National Reproductive Rights Project, uh, in all of the Akron cases. I didn't have a lot to do with the political side of um, Benson was our, he was actually a member of the national board and we always had a, a affiliate representative who would go to meetings and they would come back and tell us what happened, but I was not part of that. Didn't take. Actually, I was quite happy not to be. <laughs> uh, so I, I hope someone finds uh, that file um, and can piece that together. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe National has this stuff. One guy who might know. Have you anybody suggested uh, Rich Sapphire as a possible interviewee? That's that's a great suggestion. He's from Dayton. He has a, a very. He has a mind like a steel trap. <laughs> as they say, and uh, he may know more about that. Okay. I think that would be his area. Dave. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned previously your perception of the ACLU as you were first coming in as a legal director. Uh, do you have any perception of what the reputation of the ACLU was amongst the community during that time? Yeah, I was kind of surprised. Um, I, I went in thinking you know, I'm, I'm going to brand myself yeah. maybe irreparably by doing this, but I want to do it. So 
Um, and I, I would just be amazed at how many lawyers would come up to me and say, you know, I'm really glad you're doing that. And I really respect the ACLU. I don't agree with them hardly ever, but but I respect that they're there. Um, so, it's kind of an interesting case. We had a, a guy by the name of John Poppy, who's a lawyer up in uh, northwest Ohio someplace, Tiffin, I think, he called me up one day and he said, I am a rock-hard Republican. I hate everything the ACLU stands for. I am a gun person. I am a, actually was sort of a cowboy is what he was. He says, but a judge is trying to make me reveal to the grand jury a confidential conversation I had with a client. And I'm calling you guys to help me out. And so we did. And we went up there and he was on his way to jail at that point and we went to, I went to the local court of appeals and got the judge's order um, overruled and uh, he got out and then there was some more litigation after that but uh, that was a lot of fun <laughs> and he became kind of a fan of the ACLU after that I think he sent a large donation and uh, so but anyhow um, I, I do think that there is uh, a lot of respect, at, certainly in the legal community. I can't speak about you know the general mm -hmm. population. But, uh, I never felt ostracized by being by doing what I was doing. Do you think that the reputation the ACLU has has changed at all in recent years? Uh, I don't know about that. Um, I really don't. Um, I think it sort of depends on the case of the day. You know, if, if ACLU does something that the public is outraged by, you know, we're the devil, and then if it's a speech case or something that, that they can understand, um, they're okay with it. Mm -hmm. So during your years with the ACLU of Ohio, did the organization change in any significant way? Well, it, it became ever more sophisticated. Uh, I mean, mechanically, and in, in terms of its physical plant and staff, <coughs> it grew. And uh, there was always the, the tension between Cleveland, where most of the funding was coming from, and a lot of the talent was coming from, and the local office, and part of that was centered around Benson's personality. And uh, by the way, Benson Woolman was was a magnificent human being, as I'm sure many have told you. Um, but he was kind of stubborn, and in a very uh, diplomatic kind of way and so there there was this tension all the time but uh, anyhow I I'm glad that that ultimately got worked out uh, I think probably although I wouldn't have said that this then I think it's probably a good idea that Steve office was moved to Cleveland uh, so and you know, as I look at the organization now, it's much more organized. I, I just looked at the staff for us, for roster the other day, and jeez, uh, <laughs> I was dazzled. <laughs> director of this, director of that. Uh, you know, we were just about. I think at one point we had a staff of five. And that was about the biggest, and that that included secretary and bookkeeper and all that kind of stuff. That's so grown. Yes. Um, Chris was wanting me to ask you uh, how much of your time overlapped with Susan Gelman, clerk under Benson. Any recollection of her? Yeah. Um, she was. She was there as I think originally as a paralegal, 
Mm. Um, she was there when we were we moved from one office to another one, and she was in the second office. Uh, so that would have been about two years into the time I was with ACLU. But uh, I know Susan very well in many contexts. Uh, Susan did a lot of work on starting something called the Ohio Mock Trial Program, which was which took off and became a very um, useful way of introducing high school students to um, civil liberties issues and became an entity of, in, in itself. So. In terms of community presence, how would you compare the ACLU in 1981 with it today in 2011? I don't think it's any less significant, whether it's more. I, I suppose it probably is more. I mean, you have more staff, more resources. Uh, I'm sure that you're involved in more things. Uh, I have not been very, I have not been active at all in recent years. And so I, I haven't been to a, you know, a yearly meeting for I don't know how long. So I don't really know a lot about what they're doing at this point. For you personally, what was your biggest professional accomplishment you achieved while working with the ACI? Uh, the house didn't burn down during my watch. <laughs> that uh, was after, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, you know, I, I think I was able to marshal the resources and, and help allocate scarce resources to where they needed to be. and that sort of thing. I worked on some, some cases that, that were very satisfying to me. Some of them were a lot of fun, some of them were less so. But, uh, I could tell you about some of the fun ones if you want. Sure, go ahead. Well, we got a call from the student body of Miami University at one point, and they said, uh, we want to challenge the rule that the university has that we can't drive cars and we can't even have a car stashed somewhere so we can transport ourselves to and from home. So we went down and <clears throat> we filed a lawsuit in federal court and um, ultimately lost but had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, we had a hearing before Judge Rubin and I got to cross-examine the president of Miami University, who was at that time our Sergeant Shriver, Kennedy's brother-in-law, and uh, he cleaned my clock. <laughs> it was so, so slick. I mean, <laughs> there was no way I was going to make any headway with him. So, but that was a lot of fun. And um, had another case. Um, a Native American prisoner in the Ohio system uh, didn't want to have his hair cut and he said it was for religious issues that long hair was important to Native Americans and particularly his tribe which I think was Cherokee and so we brought a federal suit over that here in Columbus and uh, ultimately won his name was Walking Elk Shadow. Actually, Mitch Tasso was his real name. But, and we brought in a medicine man. Flew this guy in from Arizona or someplace, and he came in and testified about the significance of hair. <laughs> Judge Duncan was on that case. And, uh, he, he thought that was just a hoot. <laughs> Do you remember the case, the name of that case? Well, it would have been um, Mitch Tasso, T-A-S-S-O, versus probably whoever was then head of the prison system, which was probably Denton. Whether it be a U.S. District 
court, Southern District of Ohio case. It, and it wasn't appealed, so. Uh, and I doubt that there was a written or a published decision in the case. Yeah. But anyhow. Um, didn't, I, I should tell you about a case that I had that wasn't an ACLU case, but should have been. Um, when I was still in private practice, I was appointed to a habeas corpus case by a local federal judge, uh, and it involved a, a murder case where, and, and there was a search and seizure issue, um, as to whether the police could seize a vehicle that the owner had parked in a public parking lot. And what they did was they dragged the vehicle out of there, they took paint samples, and they were trying to prove that this car had pushed the victim's car into a river with the already dead victim in the car. Um, so it was a pure Fourth Amendment case. And uh, I took it to the Sixth Circuit, and I won. Actually, one in the district court, one in the circuit. And then I'm sitting around, and I get a petition for writ of certiorari from the state. I thought, well, fat chances they're going to take this case. <laughs> and lo and behold, they did. And so I won up in the U.S. Supreme Court by my little self. <laughs> I didn't even have the sense to um, get myself boot courted before. Uh, what really should have done is called in the ACLU and got an, amic an amicus brief, which I didn't do. And uh, so. What's that like to be litigating in the Supreme Court? It was scary as hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it came out well. I, it, we lost in the Supreme Court. I, my theory is that they just took it in because they didn't like the result. Uh, it wasn't that they made any great law. Case has hardly ever been cited since. And, but uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Warren Berger was the chief justice, and he wrote me a letter that's on the back of that thing someplace, saying thanks for, I mean, I was appointed to represent the guy there in the Supreme Court. So. Do you recall the name of that case? Yeah, it's uh, Cardwell, who was the warden, versus Lewis, Arthur Ben Lewis. Just ran across an article about Ben after he got out. He got, while he was still in, uh, he got a master's degree in business administration, and he was the first inmate ever to do that. And, Interesting guy. Yeah. So, do you feel that working with the ACLU of Ohio changed you in any significant way or impacted you in any way? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or not doing that? I mean, I was, I was already radicalized, I, I guess you would call it, <laughs> by my private practice experience. But, you know, it, it certainly broadened the scope of my interests and, uh, and made me appreciate a lot of facets of constitutional law that I never even dreamed of. So what have you been up to since you moved on? Well, I've been chasing bad lawyers <laughs> for 25 years now, or 24 years. Uh, I, at some point, uh, decided I wanted to change a venue, as it were, and this job came open <coughs> as a bar council. Uh, Ohio has a very strange disciplinary system where local bar associations have uh, the right to have disciplinary uh, committees and bring cases to the Supreme Court of Ohio. Uh, I think we're the only state where that's that exists. But uh, so we investigate grievances against local lawyers and uh, where necessary prosecute them to the Supreme Court and get lawyers disbarred, suspended or sanctioned. It's uh, that and and you know the other things that go on in a bar association are really very interesting kind of things. 
not quite as exciting as ACLU. Uh, ACLU board meetings were absolutely <laughs> some of the most interesting things you could imagine. Uh, there was I can't remember any issue on which everybody agreed. There were there were factions, uh, you know, there were the people who only wanted the ACLU to protect Wiccans. And uh, there were folks that were, uh, their issue was animal rights. And, you know, and, you know, because we're talking about which cases we're going to take, uh, there are these big debates about what's important. And, 